Section 10 of A Bunch of Keys, Where They Were Found and What They Might Have Unlocked, a Christmas book, edited by Tom Hook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Key of the Nursery Cupboard, Part 1, by T. Hook. If you open the nursery cupboard, you will see... But before I tell you what you will see, I think perhaps I ought to tell you the whole story. At the time when the old noblesse fled terrified before the first fierce upheaval of that overwhelming volcano, the French Revolution, a Monsieur de Laval made his appearance in the little town of Winchester, in Essex, and put a modest advertisement into the local paper that he was desirous of giving lessons in French, Italian, and drawing. He found pupils and employment at the various schools in the town before long, but not before his scrupulously neat dress showed signs of age and long wear. It was only from this evidence, which he could not conceal, that even Mrs. Martin, the widow with whom he lodged, was able to see how straitened the poor gentleman's circumstances were. Even when she knew it, she found it quite impossible to offer him any show of assistance, for Monsieur de la Valle was not a person to take charity with a good grace. Honest Mrs. Martin was sorely touched to see his little girl. The image of my Mary, Mrs. Martin would say, for the child was often very, very hungry and looked thin and ill. But the widow received a lesson from Monsieur the teacher, for which she did not pay, but which she never forgot. She had asked the child, as it was sitting in the garden under the lilacs, singing some quaint old French song, to come in and have a little of her tart at dinner time. The poor little thing at first refused, though its eyes said yes, it was plain that it acted under orders. But presently, childlike, it found the temptation too strong, and Monsieur passing the door saw it in the midst of its enjoyment of such jam and such puff paste as only Mrs. Martin knew how to make. A few short, sharp words in French sent the little one upstairs in tears, and Monsieur, turning to Mrs. Martin, said that he did not permit Mademoiselle de Laval to accept invitations from persons, and without consulting him. If she required refreshments, she would find them in her own apartments. And he said this, as Mrs. Martin described afterwards, as proud as a nobleman. Where Mrs. Martin had formed her idea of the pride of a nobleman, I cannot tell, for there was nothing higher than a baronet within miles of Winchester, and she knew very little of him even. But if she bought the notion out of her inner consciousness, she was more successful than many cleverer people have been in so doing. Monsieur de Laval was as proud as a nobleman because he was a nobleman, and one, too, with more than the ordinary pride of his rank. The Counts of de Laval, from time immemorial, had been among the haughtiest of the haughty French aristocracy. It was a tradition in the family that when Carlemagne passed through the province of the first count of the name, that noble received him head on head and on terms of the most perfect equality. The rest of the world, said he, belongs to you, sir, but the Count of de Laval is in peril here. His descendants had been worthy of the Grand Seigneur, and as proud as de Laval passed into a proverb. When the revolution broke out, the nobles of the Count's neighborhood enrolled themselves and their retainers, and took up arms for the defense of their property against the mob, and for a time were successful, but the Count was not among them. It is true he had mastered his vassals and armed them, but when he found that the command was to be given to Monsieur le Baron de Villemesnil, he retired in dungeon. Now, the Baron was a general a soldier by profession, and the nobles, who would have admitted the hereditary claims of the count if the country only had required defense, were wisely appreciative of the experience and ability, when the question was one of their own personal safety. 
So the Count de Laval retired to his chateau in disgust. He had troubled himself, he said, to assemble a force for the protection of these others, and they disregarded the honor. Let them guard themselves. For his part, he had no fear for himself. The rabble would not dare to come near him, and in the surrounded country the lower orders had to intimate a knowledge of and too great a regard for the traditions of the Libals. The traditions of the Libals best known to the surrounding peasantry were traditions of ancient wrong and tyranny and injustice. The result was that one night the Chateau de Leval was the center of a fierce and furious horde that danced round singing its fierce song of vengeance as the red flames shot up their lighted tongues to the frightened sky, and a pillar of fire and blood-red smoke rose above the hideous orgy. From that conflagration and the cordon of fiendish savages, not a soul belonging to the de Leval household escaped save the Count himself. He came forth bearing his child on his left arm and carrying his drawn sword in his right hand. Whether it was fear of that glittering skillful blade or some strange impulse of pity and remorse at the sight of the poor child which exerted a charm over the mob, it is impossible to say. But it is certain that the line opened to allow the Count to pass unharmed with his precious burden. That burden, by the way, was more precious than the mob suspected. The child carried and folded in her arms, as she nestled terrified on her father's shoulder, a little casket containing the heirlooms of the Tilipals. The family had not been a wealthy one of late, indeed care less for riches than birth at any time, but some antique jewels of great value had been treasured with great reverence, one of them known as the Delebal Tupas, being regarded especially with almost superstitious veneration. The Count had been a widower some three years or so. He had therefore preserved in preserving his child and the jewels, at once the hopes and the traditions of his family, its future and its past. What induced him on reaching England to adopt Winchester as his, his place of abode is not clear. Why he adopted teaching as a professor is less difficult to discover. It was the only means of earning a living that was possible for him. He was fitted for nothing else as was the case with the very many of the French refugees who found shelter in England about this time. Although not personally popular among his pupils, Monsieur de Laval, for the Count changed his name as well as dropped his title, soon became well known in Winchester and all around about as a most successful teacher. His manner was cold, even stern, but he spoke always to the point and so clearly and decidedly that he seldom failed to impress his words on the recollection of his hearers, and he never endangered his authority by allowing familiarity or anything remotely approaching it to grow up between himself and those he taught. His one fault was a hasty temper, but he kept it in great subjection. A stupidity of the most hopelessly crass description could not wear out his patience. In attention and idleness he was decided with, but they never elicited any token of anger from him. But an apparent slight, the least rudeness or forgetfulness of the respect due to him would make his cheek livid and wake a dangerous fire in his eye. In very extreme cases, he had been roused to the expression of his feelings in words. Though passionate and strong, these words never approached vulgar abuse or sank into shrewd invective. But it was universally agreed that it was a perilous work to quarrel with Monsieur de Laval. Even those non-respecters of persons, the schoolboys, knew that and made quite sure that he was not within hearing when they said, Oh, de Laval, and Mosamov stick. 
that they should not have had the nickname for him, it would be too much to expect of human nature. They despised everything French like intelligent young Britons, as they were, but they could not help feeling awe for him, partly on account of a story well known to all the boys of Finchester. There was at one of his schools in the town the son of a poor nobleman who had won for himself a distinguished position in the lower house and held a subordinate place in the ministry. The lad had been sent to get his education cheaply at Winchester. Now boys, we know, are ardent politicians, the more ardent because, as a rule, they know nothing about politics. And a classmate of this lad's, whose father was of opposition politics, had taunted him with a rumor which he had picked up, heaven knows how. The taunt was a little too sharp for the boy, and it chanced that de Laval came upon him as he was wiping away the tears. Crying, said he with a half sneer. In my country, the son of a nobleman does not know what tears are. He called my father names and said he sold himself to the government, sobbed the lad. He did, said the Frenchman sharply. And you, what did you do to him? What could I do, sir? You should have... But I forget. It is only the French language that I have to teach you, was the answer. And Monsieur de Laval went on his way. But the boy said afterwards, I'm sure he was going to say killed. And oh, didn't he grind his teeth and turn white? Binchester, as had been already hinted, was not overrun with people of rank, but its inhabitants were a decent, obliging, and well-disposed set of people, as little morally injured by a trade as is possible. They were not always cuddling their brains to get a profit out of you, and did not look upon all relations of life as business relations of which a debtor and a creditor account was to be kept mentally. They were very willing to make a friend of the French master, and for the first few years of his sojourn in the town, plied him with plentiful invitations for himself, and still more numerous ones for his daughter. But these were all declined, very politely, it is true, but in a manner which mingled a ton of surprise with a very decided hint that neither he nor Mademoiselle de Laval had any desire to make acquaintances in Winchester. The good people of that town were not disposed to make themselves miserable at his refusal, though they were perhaps a little sorry that they could not make friends with his daughter, who had grown up into a very pretty girl, and was so graceful and unassuming and good that it is no wonder she was sought after. Valérie de Laval herself probably was as much inclined to make friends as the Winchester people, but her father would not permit it. She was taught to hold aloof and decline all advances to acquaintances, just as in her childhood when Mrs. Martin offered her some dainty, she used to say her lesson. No, thank you. I'm not hungry. I couldn't eat it. But just as in those days the big gray eyes used to look wistfully at the tempting bit, so now they showed how she hungered for friendship and the companionship of those her own age and sex. Despite her father's lectures, she found it quite impossible to treat Mrs. Martin as distantly as he wished her to do. Mademoiselle Delval forgets herself when she associates with the widow of a shopkeeper he would say. So poor Valerie was very solitary, and spent her young days wearily. At last she found a pet, something on which to bestow her affection. It was not a very lovely object, but she became very fond of it. It was a poor cur, a lost and half-starved creature, which had followed her to the door and pleaded so piteously for food and shelter that she had taken it in and adopted it. Her father was far from delighted at the acquisition. Mon bleu! If it had been an Italian greyhound or a well-bred dog of any description, but this mongrel, Masseri Valerie, I fear you have not the tastes of a Delaval. 
Certainly, poor Chisin was no beauty. Her coat was long and wiry, and stuck about stubbornly in unexpected elf locks. She had lost an ear, and one eye was partially blind, and she had, oh, such a stump, such a very abridged stump of a tail. It seemed as if the fates, otherwise exceedingly hard upon her, had mercifully provided against any possibility of her having a tin kettle tied to it. Still, though outwardly unprepossessing, she seen was remarkably beautiful, morally. Her attachment to Valerie was a thing touching to witness, but it did not propitiate Monsieur de Laval. Peste, he said, for what are these lower animals made? It is the least thing that they should be devoted servants of man. He said it in a manner which seemed to imply that since the dog was intended to be devoted to the human race, it was very small credit indeed that it should be so to one of the de Leval family. He perhaps had something the same sort of idea about the canon traditional regard for that name that he had about the traditional loyalty of the lower orders to it, just before they burned his chateau over his head. However, he suffered Valerie to keep the poor cur, though he made her feel at times that it was retained under protest. When Valerie reached the age of 21, her father made a modest tea on her birthday. They had a tasteful little dessert after dinner, and a bottle of French wine, of which a glass was sent down to Mrs. Martin with directions to drink to the health of Mademoiselle de la Valle. The good woman repeated the toast, but didn't drink the wine, which she pronounced sour as vinegar. On this day the schoolmaster was laid aside, and the Count of Televal presided at the frugal table, and when he had drunk the toast with great grace and dignity, and Valerie had jumped up and flung her arms round his neck and kissed him, he brought out all that was left him of the Televal states the casket of jewels and his sword. He made a long and impressive speech to Valerie, bidding her remember that she was the last of the noble line, and pointing out to her the duties and responsibilities that devolved upon her. Then he placed the casket in her hand, and making a tender allusion to the time when she wore those heirlooms in safety from the burning chateau, told her the jewels were hers henceforth. There is, my child, another priceless jewel which you have in your keeping, the honor of the Delvals. Guard it well, for there must be a restoration of our rights some day. Until then, you have the jewels and I the sword, and Monsieur le Comte de Levade ungund the flannel bandages in which his sword was carefully swathed, silently imprinted a kiss on the glittering blade, and lifted it silently towards heaven. The next day the schoolmaster was assumed once more, and the nobleman laid by with the jewels and the sword. Not long after this, a circumstance occurred which was fated to influence the history of the Delevals. Valerie, with her faithful Chisin, was walking in the woods not far from Winchester, when the poor dog, strained into a plantation by the roadside was caught in a gin. Valerie was in terrible distress and anguish, and did all she could to release her pet, but in vain. She seemed, having exhausted all means of extricating herself, was lying on her side, panting and looking askance at her mistress, who was endeavoring to undo the cruel wire. Let me assist you, said a man's voice. Valerie looked up and saw a tall, handsome-looking young man standing beside her. She blushed and felt shy. She had little experience of the society of strangers, but the occasion was too pressing to admit of hesitation, so she accepted the offer gratefully. The gentleman knelt beside her, and in a few moments had extricated Shisin from the snare. The dog, instead of recognizing the services thus rendered, 
make use of its freedom to retire behind its mistress and snarl angrily at its liberator. Fie, she sing. Is that the way in which you express your thanks? Let me apologize, monsieur, for she sings want of manners. I am indeed indebted to you. That more than repays the little act, I can consent to do without she sing acknowledgments. I must speak to the keeper and tell him not to send his traps so close to the road, that is, if you are often in the habit of walking this way. He said this carelessly, but it was plain that he expected an answer. Oh, she seen and I come here very often. I am glad to hear it, for when I am at home the woods are a favorite haunt of mine and I may perhaps have the pleasure of seeing you again and giving Shisin an opportunity of saying thank you when her temper has recovered its serenity, which the trap has very naturally disturbed. He was sauntering along by her side. His manner was very pleasant and kind, and Valerie confessed to herself he was handsome and felt he was a gentleman. He on his side was immensely taken with Valerie, who now was a woman in appearance, with a fine figure and a beautiful face, all the more beautiful for the absence of conscious beauty. So they wandered on, and the shyness of Valerie wore off, and the gentleman was most agreeable and chatty, and treated her with such politeness and respect that she felt quite at her ease. By and by, when they came to the high road to Pinchester, they separated. As they were parting, he said, as if a thought suddenly struck him, I ought to have introduced myself long before this. My name is Paul Fern. You probably know my father, admiral by Fern by name. Valerie had frequently heard of the admiral in Winchester, where he was a very great personage being. In fact, the one baronet spoken of at the beginning of this story as the nobleman of the neighborhood. Although young Balfern made no request to learn her name, Valerie felt that she ought to tell him, in her turn, who she was. I am Valerie de Laval, she said, shyly. My father is a teacher of languages in Winchester. Oh, I have heard of Monsieur de Laval often. His reputation as an able master is widespread. I hope we shall be acquainted. Goodbye, Mademoiselle de Laval. I trust this will not be our last meeting. He did not seem quite sure whether she would shake hands with him, but she did, in all frankness. You see, she had had no opportunity of learning the convenances, and she followed the dictates of her heart which was warm and generous and trustful. Goodbye, she seen, but she seen only growled and showed her few remaining teeth. And so the pair separated. Valerie did not revisit the woods for several days. She was afraid that Reginald Balfern would think her overbold, but it must be confessed she felt a strong inclination for a walk in that direction an inclination which, at last, she found it impossible to overcome. Accordingly, one day, she and Shisin found themselves once again in Admiral Balfour's plantation. They had not walked far before Shisin sprang forward, barking fiercely, and made a rush towards a gate on which Reginald Balfour proved to be sitting, when Valerie came up. You ungrateful, Shisin! said Valerie. Oh, Monsieur Balfin, what an ungrateful creature, isn't she? And she shook hands with him. I thought you had forsaken the woods. I have not seen you since the day of Shisin's mishap. Have you been here? No, I have hardly been out of doors since. Ah, you should make the most of this weather. It will not last long. You see, the leaves are turning already. Look, they have even begun to fall. We shall have fogs and damp soon, when Balfour Woods will not be the best place for a promenade. He fell into his old place by her side, and they strolled along, 
talking pleasantly. They were quite like old friends now, and by the end of the walk there began to creep into existence another feeling than friendship. Before the threatened fox and dams came, and while yet the red and russet and gold glories were lingering on the woods, these two young people had met again and again, and their love was no secret between them, though it had never been confessed. That love had become Valerie's life now. All the treasured passion of her nature centered in Reginald Balfour. Her solitary life had not allowed her affection to run to waste. It was hoarded up for this time and this man. She worshipped him. And so, when the moment came and he asked her to give him her heart, she could only tell him that it was his already, and let her head sink on his shoulder, while, through the mist of the happy tears, all golden dreams of bliss and peace and content floated before her eyes. It had not been with any intention of concealment originally that Valerie had not told her father of her acquaintance with John Bonfern. She did not tell him of the first meeting, because she fancied he might become alarmed at her solitary walks and forbid them, and because she did not wish to cause him anxiety. By and by, when her heart became the shrine of a deep and earnest love, the subject was too sacred to be spoken of. And now, when the love was confessed, and she and Reginald had plighted faith, she learned that there was a reason for continuing her silence. The admiral, Sir Matthew Balfour, was a specimen of the old school of naval officers, a man full of strong prejudices, quick-tempered, obstinate, domineering. He ruled his household as if it had been a man of war, and his language and bearing were those of the quarter-deck, and among his strongest and most enduring prejudices was a hatred of friends and Frenchmen. Reginald Balfour, his son, had been brought up in slavish fear and obedience, as might be expected. He did not know what it was to have a wish or will of his own in opposition to his father until he met Valerie, when love as usual broke down all barriers. But Reginald was still stood in terrible awe of the admirer and dreaded, above all things, that he should learn how his son was paying attention to a Frenchman's daughter. Above and beyond this, Reginald was selfish irredeemably selfish, and if he feared to disobey his father by force of his education in the dread of his wrath, he also was anxious not to suffer the consequences of that disobedience, for the old man's first threat on every occasion was to cut him off with a shilling and leave him a beggar. There was, under these circumstances, a very powerful reason for his trying to conceal his attachment for Valerie. His father had been married a second time to a widow with two grown-up daughters, and there was no love lost between him and his stepmother, who was very anxious to contrive the usurpation of his place in his father's affections by her daughters. The old gentleman, however, had his family pride, and there was no fear of Reginald's being superseded, as long as he did nothing to bring himself into disgrace. He laid all this before Valerie and begged her to keep her engagement a secret, which she readily consented to do. He was hers, that was enough. She was content to wait patiently for years, calm in the consciousness of his love. The knowledge of that seemed the perfection of happiness, and she needed nothing more. Meantime, she seen. Having at length been induced to overcome her dislike to Reginald, had rushed into the other extreme and was as extravagantly fond of him. Unluckily for her, she had not the sense to reserve the demonstrations of her affection for the proper occasion, and accordingly one day, to Reginald's horror, when he had driven into Winchester with his stepmother for some shopping, he found Shishin yelping and jumping about his legs with every token of delight and friendship. 
The next time he met Valerie, he told her of this unfortunate indiscretion of the dogs. You must get rid of the dog, Bally darling. Lady B is as keen as a needle, and if she had seen, she seen with its owner would have made dangerous conjectures. She seen must go. Valerie's eyes filled with tears at the thought, and she pleaded for her favorite to whom she reminded Reginald the older acquaintance. But Reginald's safety was concerned, and therefore Reginald had no mercy. Valerie was ready to sacrifice anything for him, so devoted and blind was her love. So poor Shisin was handed over to Mrs. Martin with orders that she should be given to someone who would be kind to her. And Valerie, being questioned as to the reason of her parting with her pet, said that it was because Papa did not like dogs, and she seen annoyed him much, though he would not say so. But she seen was not so easily to be got rid of. She returned from her new home so often that at last it became necessary to try and send her away to some distance. She was given to a bargeman who was going up the canal with orders to keep her tied up for two or three days. But even this was not successful. Within a week after her departure, Shisin was back again, half starved and travel stained and ready to drop with fatigue. Valerie was so touched by this fidelity that she could not find heart to send the dog away again, and when next she met Reginald, tried to obtain a reversal of the sentence of banishment. She learned, however, that on her way home this last time, she seen had passed by the front house, had recognized Reginald at a window which opened on lawn and had rushed in and covered him with muddy caresses to the great astonishment of the family who were at breakfast. He had been obliged to order the servants to drive her away with whips to her other bewilderment. This had sealed her fate. Reginald told Valerie that a friend and brother officer of his was about to sail in a few days and would take Shisin on board and thus forever bear her beyond reach or mischief. Valerie sorrowfully consented and took a farewell of her old favorite, and Reginald carried Shisin off with him, and going to the river after he parted from Valerie, tied a stone around the poor dog's neck and deliberately drowned it. A few days later, Valerie, walking on the banks of the Vin, saw the bloated but still recognizable corpse of poor Shisin aground in a creek. It was a warning but obeying one. She did not for a moment suspect Reginald. And thus time glided on, and Reginald and Valerie met frequently and forgot, in the idle purposeless dreaming of love, the stern necessities of real life, until one day the former learned from a letter written by a friend in London that he would soon be recalled to his ship, which was to be ordered to join the fleet. Then the two young people were obliged to look this actual world in the face, and each looked at it from a different point of view. Valerie was heartbroken at the thought of Reginald's leaving her, and leaving her to face the dangers of war, but beyond that she thought of nothing. Reginald, on the other hand, felt anxiety chiefly because he feared that in his absence some other might step in and carry off Valerie, and yet he dreaded to discover their love to his father. The only possible way by which he could secure Valerie, and yet not endanger his position with his father, was a secret marriage. To this he hardly dared to hope that Valerie would consent. He formed his opinion partly, it is true, from his knowledge of Valerie's character, which was too noble and too frank to deal readily in concealment and evasion. But we know that love, though it often enhances our virtues, can, when needful, make us consent to minutes we should not dream of in our sober senses. 
Reginald's chief reason, however, for supposing that Valerie would refuse to marry him secretly was the consciousness that he himself, in a like case, would hesitate before making such a bad bargain. He judged of her by himself, and he was wrong. She loved him far too well not to condescend to the measure he proposed, and she never thought of herself. For her part, she could have trusted him, and hoped and waited on, but as he wished to make her his wife, she was ready. She must be his wife, she could be no others. What did it matter whether it was now or in a few years, if it was publicly known or a secret like their love? The Delevans belonged to the old Huguenot nobility, so there was no difficulty in the question of religion and Reginald speedily found means of making Valerie his bride under circumstances of the utmost secrecy. His departure was unexpectedly delayed longer than he anticipated, his vessel having been detained to form part of a convoy. Before he left England, his wife confided to him the tender news which should make a young husband's heart so full of joy and pride and happy solicitude. But Reginald was only rendered anxious and terrified. He once again bound Valerie by the most solemn obligations not to reveal their marriage to anyone under any circumstances. It was impossible that he did not see what misery unspeakable this must entail upon her, but it was not in his nature to consider how great were the sacrifices he exacted provided only that he was insured against discomfort or loss. It was rather to prepare against any extremity which might endanger his secret than with a desire for her well-being and peace of mind that he gave Valerie the address of his old nurse, who was a pensioner of the family, living down by the sea coast in her native village. In any difficulty, he told Valerie to write to her. In a few days he had sailed. Poor Valerie, so young, so inexperienced, so innocent. She little knew of the terrible consequences of her promise. It was only one sweet hope that she saw of the future. The dark, terrible side was disregarded. But the day of anguish and trial and tribulation came at last. It is impossible to describe the horror and anger of Monsieur de Laval when he discovered, as he believed, the shame which had fallen on his house. Wretched girl! How long is it since I told you that the honor of the house of the de Laval was in your keeping? Poor Valerie, who had sunk into a chair at the first outburst of the storm, could only rock to and fro with a low moaning. She had of late begun to dread this, but she never thoroughly realized it until it came. What have I done, said the old man firstly, that this dishonor falls upon me in my old age, that my gray hairs are disgraced? Mon Dieu, what have I done to deserve this? As he glanced upwards, defiantly almost, his eye caught the sword which hung over the mantelpiece. He snatched it down and tore off the covering. True, you are my friend. I know my duty. Then turning to Valerie, he said in a harsh, hoarse whisper, his name. But she only stretched out one hand deprecatingly and sobbed as though her heart were breaking. Miserable creature, it is not enough that you have brought shame upon me. No. No, I have not, father, was all she could find strength to utter. Liar, as well dishonored, you have lost forever the good name of the de Lavals, which was entrusted to your keeping. Tell me his accursed name, that I may wash out this stain in his blood. No, no, it cannot, it must not be, I am innocent. You persist in your falsehood. You are certainly no Adeleval. Adeleval never lies. But his name, his name, 
By heaven I will have his name. He caught her by the wrist with his left hand and shook her fiercely. His name! His name! Never! she gasped. The brutality had roused the spirit of the daughter. She faced him now as bold as himself. He paused for a moment, looked at her with a gaze of concentrated rage and hate, and then flung her over him. Mon Dieu! Lost! Lost to everything! Nameless! Shameless! Abandoned! Go! Leave me! Out of my sight! Let me never see you again! And you! He looked at his sword. Once guardian of the honor of my race, your task is done. I am an old man and must die soon, and the honor of the Delevals is departed. Your mission is at an end. There is no more need for you. My heart is broken. Break you, too, spotless blade. Break! He placed the sword across his knee, a snap, a tinkling clash, and he flung the broken weapon from him, sank into a chair, and burst into an agony of tears. Then all Valerie's anger melted away, and she stole up and tried to soothe him. But at the first touch of her hand, he shrank back and sprang to his feet. Touch me not! Your touch is defilement, disgraced, dishonored, shameless wanton. Go, I say. Leave this roof. You are no child of mine. Go! He whipped her off fiercely. His voice choked. He staggered a moment, and then fell heavily to the ground in a fit. Valerie rang the bell in terror and sent Mrs. Martin for a doctor. Monsieur de Laval was placed on his bed and before long began to recover, but only to sink into a state of feverish, delirious weakness. Even though the shadow of madness and the mists of half insensibility, he kept crying to them to take Valerie out of his height. She left the room at last for the doctor said his patient would be no better while she stayed there. Then she seated herself on the threshold outside the bedroom door, and listening, weeping bitterly, but in silence. She could hear him still moaning, thrust her from my roof. Shame! Shame! And he continued complaining thus until the opiate which the doctor had administered began to take effect and he fell into an uneasy slumber. The doctor, coming out of the room at last, almost fell over Valerie, who, exhausted by her emotion and the terrible anxiety of the scene she had gone through, had sunk against the doorpost almost swooning. She asked the doctor faintly if her father was better, out of danger. Yes, I trust, madame, said he very stiffly. He was a harsh man and very cold, but I cannot answer for his life unless my orders are obeyed. Your presence will endanger his recovery. You must not go near him. And he went away without even wishing her a good morning. Mrs. Martin, too, was very frigid and would hardly speak to her. It almost broke poor Valerie's heart to find everyone shrinking from her. What was she to do? This was no longer a home for her. She must find a shelter elsewhere. So she packed up her few clothes and trinkets and determined to go to her husband's old nurse. For a long time she was uncertain what she should do about the jewel casket. It was hers, she felt, and she had done nothing to forfeit it. By and by, when her husband came home and claimed her openly as his wife, she could return to her father and say, I have kept all the jewels of the Delevals, and that priceless jewel, our honor, take me back to your arms. Yes, she would retain the casket. If her father was angry at her doing so for a while, he would know all before long. She stole into his room to take one last look at him before she went away. He was sleeping calmly now. She crept to the bedside, kissed his hand, and bathed it with tears. 
As she did so, she heard him murmur, Lost, lost, take her out of my sight. Even in his dreams, this terrible mistake was haunting him. It was like a stab to her poor heart, and she hurried from the room. Reginald, dear Reginald, husband, what am I not suffering for your sake? It had indeed been a painful struggle, but Valerie was determined to keep her solemn promise to her husband. She knew that if she told her father and tried ever so hard to convince him of the necessity of keeping the marriage a secret, he would refuse to do so. He would not understand how anyone could feel dishonored by an alliance with the Delebales, and he would not consider that her husband's interests were at all comparable with the necessity for guarding the name of the Delebal from even the shadow of suspicion. End of section 10、section、eleven of a bunch of keys Where they were found and what they might have unlocked. A Christmas book, edited by Tom Hood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Key of the Nursery Cupboard, Part 2, by T. Hood. So, with her little box, she took her departure for the village where her husband's nurse resided. It was a small fishing place, about thirty miles from Winchester to the north, and was to be reached without great difficulty. She had to take a fly from Winchester to Sibley Crossroads, where she took the coach that carried her within four miles of the seaside village, which was called Halborough. It was a poor little village. Depending for support on the Spratt fishery. It was situated on a belt of a marsh that extended for miles along the coast, and behind it stretched away leagues of rich cornland, protected from the floods which overran the marshes by an embankment. Halvorod itself stood on a little knoll which sometimes in severe winters, when the waters were out, became an island. It was a dreary, desolate place at the best of times, but it was at its dreariest and darkest pitch of desolation when Valerie reached it. Winter was far advanced, and the marshes were immense lakes of leaden colored water, taking their color from the leaden sky whence the rain was descending in lashing torrents. Scarcely seen through the drift, a dark sea. Edged with cruel white foam that looked like monstrous fangs devouring the coast, filled up the background of a straggling village of poverty stricken houses, most of them mere hovels. To be sure, Valerie entered the place on the worst side. At the further end, there was a handful of decent cottages and shops, for it was frequented by a few visitors in the summer. And had humble pretensions to being a watering place. It was just large enough to be inhospitable, and just small enough to be scandalous. There were too many inhabitants to form the little family group which so many little hamlets present, and there were too few for them not to find everybody else's business more interesting than their own. Mrs. Booth's house was on the borders of the genteel quarter. But it was but a humble, shabby, genteel sort of place. It was a shop for the all sorts kind, displaying in its window, which was not a shop window, but an ordinary one, bits of work, small articles of drapery, toys and sweets, and some modest stationery. The old woman did not drive a brisk trade, but she was not dependent on her shop. Having a sufficient living in the pension she received from the old admiral. A green woman was Mrs. Booth, who had been the tyrant of nurseries, and had never softened it to any child but Reginald. When the poor children of Halvorough came to expend their mites in her shop, no kindly impulse ever induced her to tilt the scale in their favor, by adding one sweet drop beyond exact weight. Though, as we know, she only kept the shop as an employment, not as a livelihood. 
She gave Valerie no very warm reception. Reginald had told her of his marriage with the daughter of a French teacher and had asked her to give his wife what advice and assistance she could when the time of trouble came. As come it must, he knew very well. Mrs. Booth at once concluded that he had been entrapped into a marriage by some designing girl and took an immediate dislike to Valerie without having seen her. But she, of course, determined to do all that Reginald asked her to do. She would have died for him, have suffered any pain or discomfort to save him from trouble. It is curious to observe how often selfish people get this sort of devotion, and from how many people, women more especially. There was one thing which the old woman had made up her mind to do, to persuade Valerie, no matter by what means, to forego her claim to be Reginald's wife. It was a heart savage designed from one woman to another, an utter forgetfulness of all sympathy for her sex, but you remember that Mrs. Booth had only one tender place in her heart, her affection for the boy she had nursed. She gave up to Valerie the room over the shop. It was a dark, smoky chamber, but it was the best in the house, and it was better furnished than any of the others. When Mrs. Booth left the family to come here, Reginald's mother, who was a good, sweet woman, she might have changed her son's nature had she lived longer, gave her all the furniture of the nursery, with which the old woman had filled up this room. Over the mantelpiece hung an old picture of a child's head, not Reginald's portrait, but a portrait of a little girl, one of the Balfour family, in which the nurse had said she saw strong likeness to the boy, and which she had begged of her mistress. It was not a valuable picture, and no one knew whom it represented, but if it had been twice as important, Lady Balfour could not have refused it to her boy's faithful and devoted nurse. Before Valerie had been with her long, Mrs. Booth perceived that she was in error as to her having entrapped Reginald. Her love for him was too real and unaffected. But the old nurse was nevertheless still determined, if possible, to separate her from him. He must marry someone worthy of him, not the child of a poor schoolmaster. She was not astonished to find that Valerie was ardently attached to Reginald. That seemed to her only natural. He was a sultan in her eyes, who had only to throw his handkerchief to make a woman his slave for life. It was through this devotion that she first tried to work out her project. She pointed out to Valerie that she was ruining the man she loved. His place was high up in the world, but she was dragging him down. If you are as fond of him as you say, you must see that. His whole career is spoiled by your marriage, and he might have aimed so high. If I were placed as you are, I would never ask for recognition. Good heavens, woman! What are you counseling? For the happiness of the man you profess to be ready to die for. This is not as much as time. You will still be his wife in reality, whatever the world may think. But my father... My good name! What is he to your husband? And your good name, I thought you said you would die for him. Ah, this is worse than death, Mrs. Booth. Childish nonsense! And for this babyish stuff, you will make him lose his position? I do not understand you. Who will respect him when he has for a wife the discarded and suspected daughter of a French teacher at the school in Winchester? My father is a count in his own land, said Valerie proudly. The old woman laughed a short, sharp laugh. That will be a poor recommendation to my old master. He might forgive his marrying the child of an English beggar in the streets, but not the daughter of a French king. Ah, me, what is to be done? sighed Valerie. But perhaps when my Reginald comes home, he will let me tell Papa, and then we can wait patiently. I do not value even my good name so much as Reginald's happiness. Pshaw! 
Don't you know that your father will be only too delighted to blurt out the secret? It isn't every man whose daughter can marry a ball firm. Valerie felt that her father's pride would revel against the concealment. The future looked very dark. Do you think, said the old woman after a pause, that I was not born and educated for something better than a nurse's place? My father was a clergyman who took blue pills. I was clandestinely married to one of them, the heir of to a title. I knew that the discovery of our union would be his ruin, and I never claimed to be acknowledged with his wife. He died five years afterwards, but I did not seek recognition by his family. Other women, you can see, can do what you are called upon to do. Now, this story was partly true and partly false. It was true in the main. It was false in all the important particulars. Mrs. Booth's father was a clergyman and took pool pills, and Mrs. Booth had been secretly engaged to one of them, but he was only the son of a wealthy tradesman and had jilted her after he went to college. Her father had become a bankrupt, had his comb taken from him for some questionable practices and died in the debtor's jail. This was why Mrs. Booth had been obliged to go into service as a nurse. But her story and her conversation were enough to make poor Valerie miserable. Still, however, the young wife hoped for the best and looked for Regnault's coming as the cure for all her doubts and difficulties. In due time, Valerie's child was born, a little girl. Ah, what a comfort there was in that child. The mother seemed to gather fresh strength and hope from looking into her baby's eyes. It delighted Mrs. Booth to see how wrapped up Valerie was in it, for she thought that it would usurp his father's place in her heart and make the resignation of him easier. But she somewhat miscalculated in this, as she discovered one day when she overheard Valerie talking to the little thing. Would they have me give you no father, darling? Oh, no, no. I would sacrifice myself, but not you, your poor little helpless angel. Heaven give me strength and life to watch over you. Then Mrs. Booth saw that she must change her tactics. She resolved to adopt a new plan. She must work on the mother through her child. And a very cruel plan it was that she devised. When Valerie was growing stronger, she came one day and sat down beside her on the bed. My dear, she said, now that your trouble is over and you have a child to love, I had better tell you everything. You must be prepared for the worst. Valerie leant forward with starting eyeballs, speechless, trembling, faint with terror. You have been deceived. Captain Baldfirm cannot recognize you as his wife. Cannot recognize me? No, for you are not really his wife. The ceremony was not legally performed. I have his own authority. Oh, impossible, impossible, cried poor Valerie, flinging herself down on the pillow and bursting into tears. It was not an intentional deception, said Mrs. Booth who could not, even to do him a service, make Reginald appear criminal. But it is a barrier, an insurmountable barrier, to your ever being acknowledged. In fact, you cannot be acknowledged what you are not, his wife. But he loves me so dearly. I know he loves me. He will not desert me, for I am his wife. A mere oversight in the ceremony cannot be so fatal to our happiness. Cannot desert you? What has he done now? Did he not leave you to the certain chain of discovery and to the wrath of your father? Did he not bind you with a slim bow to conceal the only thing that could save you? Does this look like love, like the affection of a fond husband? Valerie groaned. All this was terribly true. She had tried again and again not to think so but the old woman's words came home irresistibly to her mind. My child, my poor fatherless child, what will become of you? 
Oh, the child will be provided for, and so will you, no doubt, dear. You are not the only woman who has suffered and been deceived. I have no doubt Captain Bolfern will place his child where it will be well cared for, and send it to school when it grows up. Valerie hugged her baby to her breast. No, no, my treasure, my darling, I have bought you at the price, and they shall not take you from me. Well, if you don't want to have it taken away, you had better let no one know where you are. And then this hard old woman, with her handsome face, as stern as if it were chiseled out of stone, left the room, and poor Valerie went through her dark hour alone. Mrs. Booth had triumphed. Time rolled on, and no news of Reginald came. The old woman was delighted at this at first, for it made her case stronger, and gave her poison time to work. But presently she became alarmed. She received her pension quarterly through the commander of the Coast Guard station, and there was generally a short letter from the admiral with it. He was too anxious about his son. At last he wrote that he feared he was either dead or a prisoner for his vessel had been captured by the French. She did not speak of this to Valerie, who had ceased now to ask about her husband, as Mrs. Booth had represented to her friends and acquaintances at Holborough that Valerie was a niece of hers, whose intellects were weak and who had had a misfortune. The poor girl had no opportunity of hearing any news from anyone else, for she was generally avoided or taken no notice of. Valerie's little girl grew up a delicate and strange child. She had no playfellows and was always with her mother, until she was old enough to be allowed to go out on the beach by herself. She had the sea for a playfellow then, for she did not care to make friends with the other children she met there. They were too rough and rude in their gambols for her. She used to sit on the sun hills looking at the distant ships dreamily, and singing some little French air that she had learned from her mother with her tiny travel. The people of Halborough gave her a wide berth, for they were a superstitious people, and fancied there was something elfish about her, with her strange songs and her beautiful golden hair and large gray eyes. Next to the sea, she loved the picture over the mantelpiece of the bedroom. That little girl was so quiet and nice that she wished she would come and play with her, she said. As may have been imagined, poor Valerie had little enough money. She and Mrs. Booth had to pinch sorely to make both ends meet, and, as a consequence, poor little Amy had but few toys or childish treasures. It was only natural that when she saw other little folk in possession of beautiful dolls, she should sigh at times for something like them, and then her mother would tell her that she should have one when her ship came home. By degrees, Amy began to look forward to that event, and to connect it with a great many things. Mama, will my little girl in the picture come and play with me when the ship comes home? She asked one day and her mother covered her with kisses and told her some fond, foolish story about the little girl and how she was sailing in the ship and what a beautiful ship it was and how full of riches and that they were all for this bed Amy of mamas. How often the child's prattle grew the poor mother's heart. There was once a terrible anguish for poor Valerie in the little one's words. It was during the summer when Halborough could boast its visitors and make believe it was a watering place. Valerie and the child were sitting on the sand hills, the mother working, and Amy at her usual occupation, watching the sails in the offing, and wondering whether any of them belonged to her vessel. A merry group of little ones passed by, frolicking and laughing round their father. Papa! Papa was constantly on their lips, and was carried by their cheery voices to where the two were sitting on the sand hills. Amy looked very thoughtful as she watched them, and then, turning to her mother, said, 
Mama, other little girls have papas. Haven't I got a papa? Where is he? Valerie was almost choked with the effort to repress her anguish. She could not speak. Will he come too when the ship comes, Mama? Oh, how I wish I could go see it sailing in with its purple silk sails and its gold mast and its fluttering flags. Will Papa come with the ship, Mama? Yes, darling, yes, I hope. I cannot tell, I hope. And Valerie turned away, for the big tears that would not be denied were rolling down her cheeks. Think of that, Dolly, said Amy to her poor old battered wooden doll. When the ship comes home, Papa will bring us such lots of fine things, and you shall have such grand dresses, Dolly, and though there will be great fine wax dolls, like the little girls at Seaview Villa, I love you the best still, next to Mama, Dolly. Amy was five years old now, but there was still no news of Captain Balfern. If there had been, of course, Mrs. Booth would not have told Valerie. But that Marl had been dead a couple of years now, and his widow, though she still remitted the pension as directed in his will, did not trouble herself to write to Mrs. Booth so that the old woman was really ignorant of what had happened to Reginald. Valerie had ceased to look for his return, perhaps to care for it. She had had years to brood over the past, and his selfishness had become revealed to her. She knew that he had deliberately sacrificed her, her honor, perhaps her life, and that of his child, in order to save himself from discomforts comparatively light, when considered beside the misery to which he was knowingly condemning her. Her whole existence was wrapped up in her child now. She had no thought, no hope, except for her. In the winter of the year in which Amy's sixth birthday fell, there came a time of distress and trial for the little village of Halborough. In the spring there had been some very heavy and high tides, and the embankment of the cornlands had been broken through, and all the country was under water. Next, the spread fishery failed, but that was of little moment after all, for the fish were chiefly sold as manure for the now flooded fields, and then there were very few visitors, for the floods frightened them away. Halbrook having been an island for two whole months at the beginning of the summer. When the winter came, came the tribulation. The inhabitants of this little place always kept up a hand-to-hand -hand fight with starvation. They were engaged all the spring and summer in laying by the store for the winter, and this year there had been nothing to lay by. The farmers round about, who were the rich people of the neighborhood, had all been ruined by the inundation so the little village had to stand and face the famine alone and unassisted. With the autumn and the dense cold pots which it sucked up from the marshes came sickness, as usual. But this time the people were too enfeebled by privation, by want of food and clothing and fuel to withstand its ravages. The sickness was in the village all the autumn and on into the winter, and the churchyard at the back of the town at the edge of the marshes, so near the edge that some of the graves were half full of water within an hour after they were dug, was covered with fresh heaps of black mold, for the people had not the time or the heart to turf them. One of the first victims of the sickness was old Mrs. Booth. It was not that she was suffering so severely from want as many of her neighbors, for the pension was enough to guard her against that. But she was frightened at the illness all around. She tried all sorts of preventives, never moved out of doors, and was in a constant state of terror lest she should run risk of infection. The result was that she frightened herself into an illness which soon took an alarming turn, passed rapidly into the prevalent fever, one of a typhoid character, and the old woman died before the doctor could be summoned from Bradshaw. There was no resident surgeon, 
and Bradshaw was nearly four miles off. When Mrs. Booth felt death approaching, you may be sure that she did not look back upon her treatment of Valerie with much complacency. A deathbed is the only place in which some people can judge justly of their own actions, but it is, alas, too late to repair the wrongs then. Sorely, sorely did the old woman suffer remorse for her conduct. And with it there mingled a terrible doubt that after all Reginald might have loved Valerie very truly. He might, even now, be longing to find her, wondering where she was, and broken hearted at her loss. But it was too late. She had not even the strength to tell Valerie of the deception she had practiced on her. All that she could do, just as the world was closing to her, and her soul was on the point of taking its flight, was to clasp Valerie's hand and whisper, I did it all for the best. I did all for the best. The old woman was buried, and the fact of her death reported by the commander of the cost court to Lady Balfern. He also mentioned that Mrs. Booth had left her niece and a child, as he supposed unprovided for. Lady Volfern, however, was not the sort of woman to trouble herself about that. We have had to keep the old hag for long enough. We can't be expected to provide for all her relations, she said, as she tossed the note into the fire. Mrs. Booth had left Volfern House long before her ladyship married Sir Matthew. Then came hard times for poor Valerie. The shop, as had been already mentioned, drove but a very small trade, and her stock of money was slender. After a hard struggle, she had long ago sold some of the contents of the jewel casket, and now one by one the more precious relics which she had laid aside had to be parted with. She and Amy had to live on very poor fare. The winter was but just begun, and the jewels, which she got miserable prices for, would hardly carry them through the trying time. Amy was always a delicate and sickly child, visitors to Halbrook as they passed her with their groups of healthy, rosy children, looked at her pityingly and exchanged glances full of meaning. Sometimes an unguarded whisper would reach Valerie's ear, poor little thing, there's death in that face. Then she would snatch her child to her heart, gaze into her dear face, and try to read the doom which others saw there. But it was kindly veiled from her. She kissed the little white brow, and did not see the seal set there. She looked into the eyes, but did not perceive the strange fatal light in them. She smoothed the pale cheek, and did not feel the deadly damp. She toyed with the golden curls, and never saw their brightness was borrowed from light of another world. When the winter set in, Amy could not longer take her walk to the beach or sit on her favorite sand hills to look for the promised sail, but she used to sit at the window of the bedroom from which she could catch a glimpse of the sea. There she would stay for hours, and her mother, who now occupied the little room behind the shop, used to hear her incessantly talking to her little girl in the picture. By and by poor Amy was too tired to sit at the window. She used to lie on her bed, with her eyes fixed on the portrait over the mantelpiece, sometimes talking to it and sometimes singing snatches of song in her low voice. I am so tired, Mama was her constant complaint. She was sickening. Her mother saw it, with what alarm can be readily imagined. She sent for the doctor, but he only shook his head and ordered a nourishing diet and wine. Then the jewel casket was once more in requisition, and what she had hoped to make last for the winter was sold at once. The jeweler at Bradshaw, to whom she had sent them, was astonished at the beauty of a large topaz which was among them, but he paid her none the more handsomely for his astonishment. Poor Valerie, 
friendless, helpless, and hopeless. It was no wonder that she turned to her father now. She wrote him a long, sorrowful letter and implored his aid, not for herself but her child. She received no answer. Amy did not improve at all. She shrank almost to a skeleton, although Valerie procured the most nourishing food she could for her, while herself, poor mother, lived upon dry bread. She determined to husband every shilling in order to purchase what was necessary for her child and to pay for medical attendance. Dr. Stanford, her physician, was a poor man with a large family and could not afford to attend patients for nothing. Besides, he never saw, although her house was a humble one, any signs of poverty about and she seemed of so superior a rank in life that he never suspected her of being in want. So he took his guinea for a visit, never dreaming how ill she could spare it, though she never begrudged it, for was it not for her darling's safety? And now all the jewels were sold, and the money was going so fast, she determined to search and see what there might be belonging to Mrs. Booth that she could convert into money. Almost the first thing she came upon was a box containing letters. One of them, written in Reginald's hand, caught her eye. She opened and read it. It was the one in which he had told Mrs. Booth to prepare for his wife's arrival. It was evident from this letter that Mrs. Booth had deceived her. She was, indeed, Reginald's wife, and he intended to acknowledge her on his father's death. But the discovery came too late to revive Valerie's love for him. She only saw in his solicitude for her comfort here. A selfish solicitude. She could detect selfishness now even in the very expression of his love for her. In another letter she read of the admiral's anxiety about the prolonged absence of his son, and his fear that he was either dead or a prisoner. When she had finished, she looked toward the bed where Amy was lying asleep. For her sake, for a child's sake, Reginald, dead or alive, you will absolve me from a portion of my bow. And she sat down and wrote once again to her father. For the first time she told him of her being really married, but she did not reveal her husband's name. She said she could not do so yet, but she entreated him to have pity, to come to her, to save a far dearer life than hers. Then, having dispatched her letter, she knelt by her child's bed and prayed to be supported and granted patience and strength until she received a reply. That night Amy was worse. She tossed in feverish restlessness, and the next morning seemed worn out. All through her delirium Valerie had heard her calling to the little girl in the picture and asking her to come and put her cool hand on her hot forehead. When Dr. Stanford came, she told him of this. He looked at the picture and said, There is something odd about the expression of it. It's an old painting, a family portrait, I suppose. Perhaps it would be as well to turn its face to the wall till my little patient is better. In fever, even a staring pattern in a paper is injurious. So the picture was turned to the wall. That night Amy still continued delirious, but poor Valerie was so wearied with continuous watching that she could keep awake no longer. She dozed fitfully in her chair, too worn out to move or to do more than look to see that her child was safe in the bed. She never knew whether she was really awake or asleep, but about the middle of the night it appeared to her that she was roused by the child's talking and laughing. Amy was speaking to the little girl in the picture, and Valerie's impression was that, looking towards the mantelpiece, she saw the picture in the bright moonlight, turned round again with its back to the wall. Next morning, however, she found it as she had left it the night before, but Amy was still weaker and fainter, 
For two days the child kept fading and fading, and yet no news from her father. At last the money failed. On the third day, when Dr. Stanford visited her, she had only a guinea in this world, and that was his fee. He was struck with the change in the child. Good heavens! This cannot last long, I fear. She is sinking from sheer weakness. Poor child! The food had grown short now. You must try and make her some strong beef tea. I will ride home as quickly as I can and send you some restoratives and tonics. This is a terrible change. He took his guinea, never noticing how poor Valerie had to struggle with an inclination to ask him to let her keep it and wait a little for his fee. He mounted his horse, flinging a penny to the boy who had held it and clattered away down the street. With hungry eyes, poor Valerie watched the urchin as he turned over the penny meditatively. She called to him, You're a good boy for watching the doctor's horse. See here, I'll give you all this for your penny, because you're a good boy. She emptied a bottle of sweets into a paper and held them out to him. They were all ones. He had known them as long as he could remember in Mrs. Booth's window, but he was to get them all for a penny, so it did not matter. He took his prize and Valerie clutched the money and hurried out. How carefully she carried that greasy coin. It was her last penny in the world, and she had to save her child's life. She went to the butcher's shop in the higher part of the town. Business was very slack even with him now. A poor neck of a mutton and a spare leg of beef was all that he had to display. Valerie walked by the shop twice before she could summon the courage to enter. But the recollection of the poor pale little face on the pillow at home nerved her, and she went in. The butcher was sitting on the chopping block, whistling gloomily and cutting up a skewer for want of employment. Will you sell me a pennyworth of meat, please? It's for my bird, and it likes beef best. The butcher stared at her, chopped a ragged end of the beef and flung it towards her. She cut it up, laid down the penny, and hurried from the shop. That crazy niece of old Mrs. Booth, eh? I wonder how she gets on now her aunt's death, said the butcher resuming his seat and his occupation. Valerie hastened home and, taking a peep at her child, went down to prepare the beef tea with the poor scrap of meat she had purchased. How tedious the process seemed! The tiny teacupful of water stood simmering slowly. It seemed an hour. She kept running up and down between the bedroom and the kitchen, trembling with anxiety and terror for she could not but see that poor Amy was sinking faster and still faster. Don't smile, for heaven's sake, dear reader, but it was positively a race between the child's life and that necessarily slow process of cooking. At last, however, the beef tea was ready, and Valerie poured it into a cup, which she stood in a bowl of cold water to cool it and then she hurried up with it to the child's room. As she opened the door, she saw Amy sitting up in the bed. Mama, Mama, my little girl is here to play with me, so the ship has come home. Mama, the ship has come home at last. And then the weary head fell back on the pillow with its golden profusion of curls. One soft sigh, a smile, as the darkening eyes turned towards Valerie, and the little spirit was free and fluttered up from the dark, desolate chamber into God's presence and all the brightness of heaven. Oh, my darling, my treasure! And Valerie was kneeling by the bedside, clasping the poor little corpse to her heart as if she could cling to the life that was gone and retain it but it was only the empty casket of her jewel that she held, and even the fire that was consuming her heart could not warm it into existence. She was obliged to yield to the bitter knowledge at last, 
and then stunned and numb with the mental agony she rose from her knees and sat on the edge of the bed clasping the tiny dead hand lost to everything save the recollection of her child and insensible to all outward sights and sounds Valerie's father, after she left him, became even more reserved and self-contained than before. He saw no one, spoke to no one, save his pupils and those who employed him. He was a broken-spirited, miserable old man, and only kept alive by the old fire of his pride. But for that he must have succumbed. He was determined that no one should suspect him of grieving for one who had dishonored him. When Valerie's first letter reached him, he burst into a fit of ungovernable rage. Was it not bad enough that she reminded him of her dishonored existence, but that she must tell him that she had sold the Deleval jewels to support the child of her shame? And the old man cursed his daughter again. The second letter was as ineffectual as the first. He would not believe that she was married. A liar! The first Deleval that was a liar. She only employed the talents of her race to make her falsehood seem like truth. And he cursed her yet again. The day after this last letter reached him, a stranger came to Mrs. Martins, inquired for Valerie, and insisted on seeing Monsieur Deleval. He was a wild, odd-looking man, clothed in rags, and with a bird as unkempt as a lion's mane. He would take no refusal, but forced himself into the old man's presence. Your daughter, Monsieur de Laval, where is your daughter? It was enough. The old man instinctively guessed who was his questioner. He sprang to the mantel shelf, snatched down the broken blade of his sword, and flung himself madly on the stranger. Wretch! Betrayer! Dishonor of the race of the Leval! Die! He shrieked as he launched fiercely at his throat. But the aged man was nerveless. The stranger, he was Reginald Balfern, put it aside with ease, caught the broken weapon and flung it behind him. Fool! Weak old fool! Where is your daughter? Where is my wife? At that, Monsieur de Laval hesitated. Your wife? Yes, my wife. Mine. Reginald Balfern. Sir Reginald, if you like. Curse all titles, and all money, and all rank. My wife. If you and I haven't murdered her between us, where is she? But the father had fallen in a heap on the floor, with his head against the wall. Mon Dieu! Mon Dieu! and she was innocent. But Reginald Balfern was too fiercely moved to suffer him to lie there. He dragged him up, held him against the wall, and once again hissed his question into his face from between his clenched teeth. Where is she? And the old man, as best as he could gather his scattered senses, related hurriedly all that had happened. When he spoke of the two appealing letters, a fierce fire glittered in Reginald's eye, and he cried, Great God, you have murdered my child. And what have you done to mine? asked the old man. Reginald groaned. Let us in heaven's name do all we can to repair the wrong. How far? How far? Order a chase and a pair at once. He rushed to the bell and rang it until Mrs. Martin appeared. Order a chase and a pair, the fastest pair in the stables at once. Mrs. Martin hesitated. I order it. Sir Reginald Balfern of Balfern Hall, will that satisfy you? Curse the woman, she'd stand there staring while my wife and child are dying. Through all the strangeness of his appearance, there was something of the old Reginald's visible and Mrs. Martin recognized it and obeyed his orders. Before long, Monsieur de Laval and Reginald were tearing along the road to Halbrook as fast as two horses could gallop. Reginald Balfern had been nearly seven years a captive in a French prison. In the solitude of that long confinement, he had time to reflect on his past, and his character became softened by adversity. 
A real and deep love for his wife took the place of his old half-selfish admiration of and pride in her. And he bitterly repented the misery he had, as he knew only too well entailed upon her. When at length he obtained his freedom, he flew without a moment's delay to find her. He had been put ashore on the point of the Essex bank of the Thames nearest to Winchester, and had hurried at once across country to find her or her father. And now at length he was on the road to clasp her once more to his heart and ask her pardon. Valerie, sitting by the deathbed of Amy, did not take note of the hasty footsteps on the stairs was only roused from her unconsciousness by the sight of her father and her husband. She recognized him at a glance, as they rushed into the room. But she never moved or changed color. She was ashy pale. She was stone cold. She seemed as dead as the child beside her. They were terrified at her immobility and paused on the threshold. Her father rushed forward and falling at her feet, cried out in broken accents, My child, my child! She did not turn her head, but the white lips moved mechanically, and she answered, My child, my child! Her husband knelt beside her, and seizing her listless right hand, covered it with warm kisses and warm tears, but in her left lay the tiny hand of her dead child, and the till from it smote her heart, and she remained stern, unplacable, passionless as a statue. Then the two men shrank from her in fear and anguish, and leaning on each other's shoulders, wept like children. Lady Volfern is a fine, handsome woman, but hers are the eyes that have looked into the eyes of sorrow. The sea closes above a sunken vessel, and its surface bears no recording ripple. The billowy green turf of the churchyard swallows up the dead and shows no sign, but a happiness gone down at the sea, a buried grief, leaves an indelible epitaph graven on the human brow, leaves an undying memorial lamp that burns in the eyes of those who have suffered and survived. And if the features are thus marked, how is the poor heart scarred? Wounds of warfare deeply seem and only to be effaced when death's hand crumbles the earthen casket whereon they are written. Lady Volfern is beloved for her acts of charity, but she is reserved and silent, and even those who bless her have seldom seen her. It is supposed that she and her husband, Sir Reginald, live no less happily together than other married people. She has several children. She is an exemplary wife, an exemplary mother. But at night, when the little ones are gone to bed and the nursery is deserted, Valerie, Lady Bonfer, takes a key from a jewel casket, which contains nothing beside, and going to the nursery, unlocks a cupboard there. In that cupboard there lie a child's clothes of a very coarse material, carefully folded, with a pair of little shoes on top of them. Beside them you will see a mere log of a wooden doll, legless and armless, dressed in a common duster, tied round it with an old shoestring, a headless horse with red spots, and a little wooden spade, worn out with much digging. This is what the key of the nursery cupboard has to reveal. End of section 11